All right, one more time. I need to hear an amen or a honking of a horn. Good morning, Pittsburgh Baptist Church. <laughs> we are here. We are outside of our homes. We are here to worship today. You know, normally I don't write anything down to speak because I get all stumbled, but I usually at least think about it in my head. I'm so excited right now, I didn't even practice. I think it's so amazing. God is so big that each and every one of us are here today. I can say there's nothing that makes my heart sing and jump like it's doing right now to see each and every one of you. Whether you're in your cars back there or you're up here, I, I, am, I feel incredibly blessed right now. I also know beyond a doubt this church is blessed. The reason I say that is because although we're just on a field, this was no easy feat. I'm not sure if you've been uh, watching the weather lately or staring out your window. There's been a little bit of rain. However, every person that contributed to making this happen has such a can-do attitude. God has blessed this church with believers that are ready to worship. And I hope today that you came with that same mentality, that same eagerness to worship the one true God that made this all possible and that sustains us every day. So church, I am happy to see you. One more time, I just need to hear a honk or an amen because I am that excited. Yeah. Any time now. <laughs> all right, so let's stand to our feet and worship. great to hear most of you and it's it's great to be out here gosh you know we've been we've been recording these for so long that we've really missed you guys being out there so this is great to be able to get together and to sing these songs and let's just open up the heavens
your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we just thank you for this opportunity to be out here uh, together as one body and as we lift you up in praise. And Father, I pray that now as pastor brings your word, that you would touch even the depths of our hearts, Lord. Uh, open our hearts to hear you, Father, and, and uh, Father, just allow pastor to bring your word to us. In Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. And God's children said, Amen. Amen. No, huh? We're moving along now. <laughs> I hope you uh, have a copy of God's Word, either in print or digital. Use it on your phone or your iPad, but we want to open God's Word and learn some things together. It has occurred to me more this week than ever that the Christian life is all about relationships. And life itself is all about relationships. And that's exactly what Peter has been writing about. If you recall what we've been studying from uh, the letter of 1 Peter, he's talked about how important it is that we relate to each other, that we relate to God, that our salvation is in Christ, that we have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the foundation of everything we are as followers of Jesus Christ. Personal relationship with God through his one and only Son. But then Peter starts talking about how important it is that we relate to the government, that we relate to the people who employ us, that wives and husbands relate to each other in a biblical way. And today, he's going to jump in and talk about another aspect of relationships. But as I thought this week of how vital relationships are, I read a number of studies that have been done through the years, and I'm not going to go into all the details of them, but it's just been very interesting studies that talk about the importance of a child's development and relationships that that child has interacting with adults and with other children. And that all of that has a great deal to do with contributing to good health of that child. Um, I will tell you one, this is a rather crude story and experiment but um, in the 13th century, the Roman emperor, Emperor Frederick, had this idea, and sometimes people get this so self-centered uh, personal preference thing about, uh, and it's almost, it's really a kind of a prejudice, but you get this thing that uh, my language is the perfect language. You know, sometimes um, I've interacted with folks and just made light. We had uh, congregations in my previous church that spoke one one we had a Swahili church that about 70 people uh, who grew up in Africa and they spoke Swahili and they would always tell me in heaven we're gonna speak Swahili because that's the language of God and then I go to the Hispanic congregation and they would say no in heaven we're gonna speak Spanish we're sure God speaks Spanish and and it's just fun a lot of light but some of that can get to be pretty self-centered it was with Emperor Frederick he had this question if man had no influence from any others, surely he would naturally speak a particular language. And he wondered, would it be Hebrew, Greek, or Latin? And he thought it would be Greek. 
So in a crude experiment, he had several children shortly after they were born, isolated, and they were given some nursing care that was just the basics of food and everything, but zero communication. The nurses were told, don't talk, don't communicate to these children, and we're going to see what language they naturally began to speak. I mean, it's, it's kind of a ridiculous experiment and crude, like I said. The whole thing was sad, though, in that what happened was within several months, all of those children were dead because they had no human voice to interact with, to nurture them, to give them value, to love them, to encourage them. And it, and it just underscores how valuable our relationships are that relationships are the key to health in every way. And if you look at what the Bible teaches, frankly, everything in the Bible teaches good health, spiritually, physically, and in every way. Because if we do what the Bible says, we won't be doing drug running, we won't be out there pushing alcohol, we won't be uh, overdosing on things, even using a lot of things that we use that damage our health. The Bible focuses on value when we have a good relationship with God and obey his word. Someone is often, uh, has said that too often we underestimate the power of a smile, a touch, a kind word, a listening ear, an honest compliment, or the smallest act of caring, all of which have the potential to turn life around for the person that you're interacting with. You never know what a person needs at that particular point in their life. And there are all kinds of relationships. Uh, our closest relationships are probably family. Some, the family we grew up with, brothers and sisters or parents, and, and then uh, the immediate family when we marry and we have children, and, and then there's, there's uh, ch grandchildren, there's uh, cousins and uncles and so forth. But there are also relationships that are important as co-workers, neighbors, and other kinds of friendships. But there are also spiritual relationships. And sometimes spiritual relationships end up being the most meaningful part of our life. I remember when I was in college, a friend of mine, um, in an effort to help me have good relationships with people, set me up in a blind date. And he said, oh, you're going to like this girl. Yeah, she's, she, you're going to like her. So I, I did this blind date, and uh, yeah, she's okay. It didn't, you know, as a fisherman says, didn't pull my cork under or anything, but she was okay. But I'll tell you what happened out of that. When, uh, when I went to meet her the first time, and we went out on a date, went to her home, pick her up, her grandmother came out and introduced herself. And she was this tiny little woman, I mean real tiny, when she drove, she had to have a booster seat in the driver's car. She was so tiny, a little tiny woman. And she came out, and she just overwhelmed me with her spiritual depth and perception. And so I, I went out on this date with this girl, and I called her later and said, this may be awkward, but could I, could I come talk to your grandmother? <laughs> I... <laughs> And I didn't go very far in developing a relationship with the young lady that somebody set me up with. But that grandmother became one of my spiritual mentors in prayer, and she had my back in prayer. I, I called her Grandma Gillis for years. I went off to Texas and married Pam and went off to Texas, and Grandma Gillis, she had our back in prayer. She was so thrilled. Uh, about my marriage to Pam and then went to my first church and she had our back in prayer everywhere I was she covered me in prayer you see some relationships are all about spiritual partnership and they can be some of our most valuable that ex is exactly what Peter is trying to underscore in going on and on and on and talking about all the depth and breadth of relationships that we have in this life 
Let's look briefly at the ones he's talking about today in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. Now, don't you love it when a preacher starts with the word finally? This first verse here, verse 8, starts with the word finally. And, and there's several more chapters in this book, so he's not there yet, okay? <laughs> I'm not sure why he said finally, except he has been down a list of important relationships, and he's going to talk about the relationship we have with each other. Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another, love as brothers, be tenderhearted, be courteous, not returning evil for evil, nor reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing. Blessing. You need to stop and let that soak in. In, in our relationships, he talks about some things to be that we're going to go over, some things not to do. But most of all, be a blessing. Knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. I don't have time to dig in the Old Testament where the promise of God to Abraham was, I'm going to bless you so that you can bless others. And everyone that blesses you, I'll bless powerful but it just reminds me of that as i read this be a blessing because god wants you to inherit a blessing the way you treat others do unto others jesus said it does come back to you and then in verse 10 he quotes a psalm he quotes psalm 34 verses uh, 12 through 16 basically where he says for he who would love life and, and now let me just stop and say it's important to read the Bible and to quote the Bible. It's so important that even those who the Holy Spirit used to write the Bible, he wanted them to quote the Bible. So here he's quoting the Old Testament. The Bible quoting the Bible. Very important. He who would love life and see good days. I want that, don't you? Let him refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. God favors certain attitudes and actions, and he disapproves of others, Peter writes here. Perhaps you... Uh, have the outline, I'm going to uh, share with you a, a couple of statements that this passage gives us about the kind of person we must be. Now you remember, Peter has underscored in his letter, holiness and character and our witness, our testimony. He's been saying these things over and over and he keeps talking about the, the value of that is found in our humility, in our servanthood, how important it is that we be submitted to God, submitted to God's leaders that he puts in place, that he allows to serve in authority over us. Be submissive and have a servant's heart. These are key components for God's plan for all mankind. Key components is an attitude of servanthood. Look at, look at what he says here uh, about um, how important it is that we live for him. He first talks about the person we must be. The person we must be in verse 8. First part of that, he says, finally, all of you be. And, and I love what he did here. Have you noticed it? Any of you grammarians out there looked at that and seen? You have five adjectives and no verb. Zero verbs in that. Five adjectives and no verb five descriptive terms that he says will produce healthy relationships with other believers. And he is focusing right now on our relationships with each other in the body of Christ. He's talked about in the home. He's talked about outside the home, in the secular world, in the world of government. Now let's, let's get personal. How do we relate to each other? Everything begins with the right attitude. And there are five virtues. Let's just list them real quickly. The first one, he says, be united, be of one mind. The, uh, 
Uh, the New American Standard uses the word harmonious. Be harmonious. I love that word. It's a compound word in the Greek language. Two words slammed together that if you just translate it literally, it means same think. Same think. Thinking the same. Same mindset. Same intentions from the way that you think. Have these values that are together, united. It has to do with our minds, the way we think. And Jesus underscored this when uh, in, his, uh, in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew twenty two thirty seven, he said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Now, this is where we love God with our mind. We have same think. We have a, a, an agreement that's a, a heartfelt. It doesn't mean that we all have to like the same thing. Yeah, if you like strawberry ice cream and I like chocolate, that's fine. We're not going to divide over that. But he's not talking about personal preferences. He's talking about values. Same think when it comes to biblical values. So he said, be of one mind, be united. The next statement he says is be compassionate, compassionate. I, I like this Greek word. He, hear it. The Greek word is sympathos. Sympathos. What does that sound like? Sympathy. That's what the word is. He's saying be sympathetic. And it's translated compassionate in some translations, sympathetic. We're to uh, have a heart for other people. I have, I have a heart for what others are going through. And not just look at that and say, oh, that's tough. Sorry. But, but to have some sympathy. And some are better than, than others at that. Some of us struggle with that. Some others, it's just kind of a natural thing that you, you have a more sympathetic heart. In Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, Paul said, Let nothing be done through ambition or conceit, but with lowliness of mind. Lowliness of mind. So he gets the mindset in there. Then he says, with that mindset of one mind of lowliness, of humility together, then let each esteem others better than himself or herself. Let each of you look out not only for your own interest, but for the interest of others. That's sympathy. That's compassion, caring about what's going on in other people's lives. Now, let's admit, that's tough. You know why? Because we're all busy with what's going on in our life. You families who have children at home, that is a, that is a huge responsibility, and it ought to be your priority. And I understand it's tough sometimes to, to help someone else to get involved in someone else's life because you've got kids going in different directions and you should care for them. You should have them as your priority. That's your responsibility. So it's just tough sometimes. And others, and maybe in your business world, you have employees under you or partners in a business and you've got things to do. And, and it just, we're busy. And sometimes busyness crowds out our sympathy, our compassion. And that's why in Philippians he said to don't do things out of just conceit or ambition or selfishness, but esteem others as important, as important. See, when we stop expecting other people to please us and do what we want to do, we can expect to begin a healthy relationship with them. Then he goes on to a third thing. He says, loving as brothers. We're to love as brothers. We're to love each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. It's like uh, Philippians 1.9 says, there was a prayer. I, I love this prayer. Are you aware of the prayers that are written in the Bible? If you want to pray a prayer, pray the prayers that are already in the Bible to start with. Yeah, we can pray all kinds of prayers, but they're great model prayers. And Paul wrote to the church at Philippi, and he said this in Philippians 1.9, I pray this that your love will keep on growing in knowledge and in every kind of discernment. I pray that your love will grow in what you know about each other and your discerning sense of what God is saying to others around you and how you can be a blessing to them. And then he says, so that you can approve the things that are superior and pure and blameless, filled with the 
fruit of righteousness. And he said, I'm praying this for you. That, that's a great prayer. Pray that for each other. Pray that all of us will grow in our love for each other. Every one of us can afford that. I can. If you don't know of anybody else to pray, pray that, that prayer for me, that I will grow in love and compassion and understanding and discernment. Then he uses a, a fourth statement here, be tenderhearted. Interesting. Some translations also translate this sympathetic, but it's not the same word that was used earlier the, uh, that sounds like sympathy. It's a different word. And so he obviously switches words in order to underscore how important it is that we have a heart for each other. And in some places, this word is translated kind-hearted. In some translations, tender-hearted. But it's, a, it's a, again, a kind of sympathy, although it's the same word. Here's the difference. This word in the original Greek language has a whole lot more emotion. Sometimes it talks about, as the Greeks did, that our, our emotions come from what they called our gut, our bowels. And if you ever see that in Scripture, this is the word that's used to talk about that kind of emotion that just comes from the deepest part of us. And he says, in the body of Christ, we need to grow in that. Be tender-hearted. And then the fifth one, he says, is be courteous. Literally, that just means to be friendly. You want to hear the Greek word on that? I love it because it, it's the root for another important word. You would think that uh, if you know any of the words for love, that uh, phileo is a brotherly love, and it has this root. But this word is philofro, philofro. And it's where we get our word philanthropy is rooted in this word. What is philanthropy? It's, it's where people just are, are generous and, and give money away to specific causes. And someone is sometimes called a philanthropist. He said that's what we're to be. We're to be friendly enough to share with others. And, and that's rooted in the uh, previous verses that talk about how we are to care for others, esteem others, hold them up. So the first thing he talks about here is these eight statements of uh, the kind of person that we're to focus on developing within ourselves. But then the second statement here, he talks about the path that we must not take. This is where I got the title of the message, and the title of the message is repeating, re Repaying Evil with Good, because this is the core of what he's talking about here. In verse 9, the first phrase in that is not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling. Now we could stop right there and say, yeah, that's real hard for me because I'm not patient with other people. When they treat me bad, they treat my wife bad, they treat my kids bad, I'm going to go on the defensive. I'm going to get even. They're not going to do that to me. That's our natural tendency. But the Bible says, now, wait, wait just a minute. Did Jesus do that? Did God interfere and say, you're not doing that to my son. You're cruel. You're unjust. You're not doing the right thing. Actually, there's a purpose. And even when others mistreat us, we're to let God handle that. And I know that we like to take God's role sometimes in God's place and handle things ourselves, but... God says, no, don't do that. In Matthew 5, verse 43, Jesus was preaching like this. It was a sermon on the mount. It was an outdoor sermon. In fact, Jesus probably preached outdoors more than he did indoors. Jesus said this as he stood outside talking without a sound system, by the way. Didn't have Matt down here making sure everything was going right with the sound. <laughs> But Jesus said, you have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. He said, that's what people say. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. They treat you bad, reverse it. Don't get even. Don't repay evil for evil. Why don't you just repay the evil with good? It totally undermines them. It just pulls the rug out from under them. They're not expecting that. And they don't know what to do. But it sort of stops the whole argument right there. 
He said, bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. Pray for others. That's what we can do. In Romans 12, 19, Paul said, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And there again, Paul, writing here, is quoting the Bible, an Old Testament statement where God told his people, You let me handle this. You know, we'd, we'd be a lot better off if we let God handle a lot of things that we kind of get our grip on and try to resolve it ourselves. Whether it's remaking each other in our relationships, and I wish you'd do this, or I wish you'd be this better, or whatever. Just, just pray for each other. Pray for each other. Prayer can go a long way. And then in that same statement where he says, Vengeance is mine, I will pay. Therefore, he says, If your enemy is hungry, feed him. Thirsty, give him drink. For in doing so, you heap coals of fire on his head. And do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So this is not just something Peter's saying. It's, it's in the words of Jesus. It's in the Roman letter that Paul wrote and others on and on and on. Third, and finally, <laughs> we'll get to the last point here. He said, we want to talk about the path we are called to follow. He said, there's a saying in, in verse 9, the first part, some things that we're not to do. The path, don't go down that road. But he said, Here's the path. Here's the road you should follow. On the contrary, blessing, blessing, blessing. If we could just focus on being a blessing, knowing that you were called to this so that you may inherit a blessing. And then he quotes this passage from Psalm 32. Read Psalm 32 with the mindset of what it means to be a blessing, okay? Okay, I want to be a blessing. I'm going to put that in my mind. I want to be a blessing. How do I do that? How do I do that? He answers that. He who would love life and see good days, that's me. I love life. I want to see some good days. Let him refrain his tongue from evil. Take that tongue. Bind it. Stop it from saying bad things. He's not just talking about profanity. That's bad. That's evil. But he's saying everything, the things that we do say. He's talking about now, remember the context, being a blessing. What is it? Being a blessing. Refrain from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Be truthful. And again, this is the psalmist. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. And his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. When I read this passage, here's what comes to my mind. Here it is. It says, The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, but his ears are open to their prayers. This is the Psalms. My mind goes back to 2 Chronicles seven fourteen. A lot of us have memorized that. You know what it is. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will forgive their sin and heal their land. But we stop there and we haven't gone to the next verse that really comes to my mind. Here's the next verse. And my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. You hear that in Chronicles my, God said, my eyes are open and my ears are listening, attentive to your prayers. The psalmist says, the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. They must have been talking to each other. <laughs> same, same God put all that. But then he says, uh, in a warning, the final statement of the psalmist is a warning. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Sometimes we just think we have a right to do evil because it's our right to get even or to get back or to pay back or um, whatever it is. And he says, you just need to know that the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. That, that's the message today. And that message is about relationships. 
How do we relate to each other? Do we find it important that we pay each other back when we've said something wrong, or you shouldn't have said that about me, or you shouldn't have said that about my wife or my kids or whatever? I remember one time I was uh, joking uh, with a guy, and I found out some people, it's not a joke, but their favorite school, which is one of them in the area here, um, was not my favorite school, which is one of them in the area here. And it was in another church, but I just, he had, had dressed his daughter up in uh, one of the outfits. And he and I had a good relationship, I thought. And I thought we could kid about it. And I said, now, what are you making her wear that for? All of a sudden, he was ready to punch me out, literally. And I thought, now, whoa, 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 whoa. okay, maybe I shouldn't kid about some things, <laughs> not with some people. I mean, hey, 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 back off. This is, this, these are just schools that are temporary. They weren't here a few hundred years ago, and they won't be here in eternity. There's some things, and, and I, then I thought, well, maybe I'm wrong in, in, in saying what I said. That, that sounded evil to him, so I shouldn't have said that. But we have to be careful to not react and make everything personal and, and feel like I have to defend me and my school or my wife or my children. And, and yes, there, there, there's a value in caring for each other. But Peter is saying, hey, there's something more important. And what's important is our relationship with God. And God is looking down and saying, my face is against you if you're doing that which is evil. Let me bow in prayer, and then after the prayer, I want to say a couple of things before we dismiss. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for allowing your people to gather together here uh, that we could worship you in this uh, beautiful outdoors. Thank you, Lord, for all the people, the volunteers who have worked real, real hard to get this place ready and to provide equipment and everything. Lord, you know every one of them. I just pray you would bless them. You, you would encourage encourage them and strengthen them to be a blessing to others as they have to us today. We pray that you would take your word and help us to apply this in the ways that we can develop stronger spiritual relationships with brothers and sisters in Christ so that the body of Christ will be stronger. The church will be the witness we need to be to a lost community and a lost world. So put these words of truth in our heart. And be glorified as we honor and serve you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us today. Let me uh, update. Some of you know this, but some of you, this would be brand new to you. A number of churches have been having outdoor services and have an FM transmitter that you can sit in your car and turn, in your, turn on your FM radio. There's some churches in the area that have done that. We actually ordered one of those transmitters in, um, in the end of April, it's, it's been a while, we ordered one as soon as we saw, hey, this would be great. And when we did, they were saying, yeah, we can get you one by the 1st of July. Uh, I'm thinking, well, not exactly. We'd like to have it a lot sooner. And, and they were sold out all over the world. I ended up finding one uh, that is due here the 27th, just a few days from now. And uh, we hope to be able to continue to have some outdoor services like this. We'll do this again next week. Again, the weather can pull the plug on us real quickly. And so always check uh, Saturday and even Sunday morning at the last minute on that. But hopefully next week we will have actually an FM translator to where those who are transmitter, where those who are sitting in your car will tell you what uh, to turn to. And, and it uh, is allegedly broadcast about two miles. So um, even when we start having worship services inside the building in Pittsburgh, some could come to the parking lot and turn on their FM and listen to us outside. And at least they could wave and see some folks and feel like they're a stronger part of it, even though we would have to limit how many people could actually come in the building and have guidelines for that. So. Just want you to know, we've been working hard to try to find ways to get together, and a lot of people have been doing this, and uh, we're grateful for this time. Um, is there anything that we can pray for you about or help you in uh, through this crisis? If so, would you let one of us know? Um, deacons who are here, uh, lift your hand or stand up. If you're, if you're out here, deacons that are out here, stand up.
Stand up if you can, deacons. And then there's some in the cars. Um, you know, give us a hand. Well, there's a couple back here. Yeah. Do you know who some deacons are? Just want you to be sure you know, and you should know who your deacon is. We're here to help and to serve. So don't hesitate right now to let somebody know how we can bless you, how we can help you or be an encouragement to you. Thank you, uh, men, for standing and for serving and all you're doing. Um, anything else we need to say or help you with before we go? Are we good? You're welcome to fellowship, but of course, social distancing is important. Some people felt a lot better staying in their car. We understand that. We support that. Um, we have an offering box as you exit. If you would like to put an offering in, and, and um, Jimmy's right here has some offering envelopes, a stack of them, just in his uh, red car here, red Buick. And he's going to be available if you want to get one of those on your way out. We're here to help with that. Uh, otherwise, pray for each other, encourage one another. I hope life groups will find ways to get connected with your life group. And I'm sending some follow-up studies of this sermon to where you can talk about this a little more in your life group. And uh, also use the Right Now Media. Um, we'll point you to some of the studies in there. They won't be word for word what we're doing, but there was a, a little video clip about the passage that I'm doing today. And, and uh, he sort of uh, went down a similar road, but um, go to Right Now Media and listen to that. Okay? Thank you so much for coming. God bless you. Let us know how we can serve you anytime and any way. And you want to sing. We've got a song we can do together. Let's stand together. Let's... Uh... Let's stand together and let's just sing a verse of Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound That saved a wretch like me I once was lost but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Amen. Thank you.